Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Rita. And thank you all for coming on this evening. Um, it's a very great honour to speak to you all. As you've heard, I am the Strategy Manager for Climate Change Adaptation and Water at the Great London Authority. So I'm preparing what I hope will be the first climate change adaptation strategy for a world city. And in doing so, we've identified that flooding is one of three key climate risks for London, along with droughts and heat waves. So hopefully that gives me the suitable background to give you a very quick canter through flood risk management in London. I'm really just going to set the scene um, and hopefully provide some context for us to have some uh, discussion afterwards. So London is actually vulnerable to five types of flooding, or flooding from five types of sources. Um, the big one down the Thames tends to be the one that captures uh, the imagination, certainly Hollywood's over-imagination. And uh, I'm not going to talk about tidal flooding. I'm going to leave that to Dave. I'm not going to steal his tidal wave. Um, but I will talk to you about the other sources. Uh, fluvial flooding. This is from the freshwater Thames and from the tributaries that flow into the Thames. Surface water flooding from that rainfall that cannot enter into the sewer or the drainage network and ends up in our doorsteps. Sewer flooding, actually when the sewers back up because of the sheer pressure upon them and groundwater flooding. Um, I will certainly be focusing most of my presentation actually on, on fluvial and surface water flooding. But what one concept I really want you to take away with you this evening is this concept that risk has three components to it. Probability, consequence, and vulnerability. And in order to have sustainable risk management, you need to focus on each of those three components. So if you have no probability of a risk, of a, of a flood, there is no risk. If you have nothing of consequence, in an area that might be flooded, you have no risk. And if you're not vulnerable to the flood, again, you have no risk. So my role, I believe, is to try and look at those three components and work out how in London we are going to sustainably manage the risk by sustainably managing those three components. So first of all, let's look at probability of flooding. This is a flood map, shows the areas of London at flood risk, or rather, as I prefer to look at it, the area of London protected by the flood defences. Now, you can map probability by understanding what is the standard of protection provided by those defences and the area that those defences protect. So you see various multicolours here. I apologise it doesn't come up too sharp, but basically the darker the blue, the better the standard of protection. You can see on the tidal areas, we're actually, along the Thames, we're actually very well protected, some of the highest standards of flood protection in the world. But you can see on some of the tributaries of the Thames, that standard of protection actually decreases. Um, to a point in some of the rivers, actually, it's quite a low standard of protection. This is a key area that we need to be working on. 15% of London actually lies in the flood risk area, um, and this is a key area that we need to understand better. Unfortunately, we cannot yet map surface water flooding, but this is something that we're working on and I will return to later in my presentation. Then to look at consequence, who and what is in the flood plain? Basically, there are nearly half a million properties inside the floodplain. We're looking at 343,000 properties at risk of tidal flooding and about 133,000 at fluvial risk. However, 82% of these are actually at quite what is considered to be a low risk. But that doesn't mean that there are 100,000 homes in London actually at what we call medium or significant risk. The way probability is expressed is generally in return period, so the number of times um, you would be flooded within a thousand year period. So one example on the slide before, we had the light blue one in 20. That means in a thousand years, if you were to break into 20 year components, those homes would be flooded once every 20 years. The third component, sorry, I'm just going to return to this. You see actually there is a significant amount of infrastructure lying within the flood zone. 49, um, 46 police stations, 20 fire stations, 49 railway stations, 75 underground stations. These are things that don't like getting wet. And yet we also have to remember these are things that are very well defended. But one thing that you have to also take away from this is the concept of residual risk. That is the fact even though something is protected by a flood defence, we still need to plan for what would happen if that flood defence were to fail. So if it was to be breached or overtopped. Another concept you need to look at is vulnerability. What are the things that actually make something or someone more vulnerable to flooding than the average these can be summarised under a number of headings, such as exposure, sensitivity. So do you live in a basement flat? Do you live in a, in a um, ground floor flat? Warning times. Some of London in the shaded areas here have less than a three-hour warning period between rainfall falling and their potential of being flooded. The urban realm has become increasingly impermeable. 
So rainfall runs very swiftly off the concrete into the drains and into the rivers. And if they were already are saturated, sometimes that backs up. Also issues we need to be looking at are the capacity to react. Do people have the information? Have they, have they been given suitable warning time? Do they have insurance? Unfortunately, it is often the poorest people who are most at risk and, have the, and are least likely to have insurance, least likely to have the forewarning, and least likely have the capacity to act. This chart basically plots who is at risk in flooding in London based upon a number of socio-economic indicators. One indicates the 10% poorest people in London. 10 equals the 10% most affluent in London. The top graph is for fluvial flood risk, and you can see it is both the poorest and the richest people who live at flood risk. However, if you look at the graph below, it is generally the poorest people who live at tidal flood risk. This means that we have to adapt our responses differently for tidal and fluvial flood risk. The difference for the richest people is they are more likely to have insurance, more likely to have a second home, and more likely to have the mental capacity to withstand the impact of the flood. Quite often, it is not just the impact of the flood itself, the physical impact of flooding the home or the office that causes the problem. It is the mental stress that comes afterwards of dealing with insurance agencies, replacing what you have and not being able to replace those irreplaceable things. Flood risk is going to increase. I'm afraid this is a sorry fact, but it's something that we have to recognise and something we have to work with. We have an ageing flood defence infrastructure. Some of it is over 300 years old. We have decreasing permeability of the urban realm. I think an area of about 22 times the size of Hyde Park has been lost to concreting over front gardens to provide parking standards. London is growing. We are going to put more people, more assets, and more valuable assets in the floodplain. And the climate is changing. So if we look particularly at climate change, my personal sphere of interest is the fact that we see a number of changes happening. Tidal flood risk is increasing because we're seeing an increase in sea level rise, and we're seeing an increase in the frequency and magnitude of tidal surges. Fluvial flood risk is increasing because we're seeing more seasonal rainfall. The amount of rainfall through the year is going to stay approximately the same, but we'll see more in the winter, less in the summer. And when it does fall in the winter, it's going to tend to fall in heavier, more monsoonal-type downpours that are the sort of things that overcome the current drainage network. And surface water, 30% more in increase in, water, in um, winter rainfall. This complex mix means that we have a complex situation and we're going to need to justify our, our response to this in a number of different ways. This is just my personal starter for five to get some discussion going. I believe the first thing we need to do is to be reviewing the strategic level flood plan for London. We had a flood plan for London prior to having the Thames Barrier. And then when we built the Thames Barrier, we felt the job was done. Two years ago, the London Resilience Forum reviewed this and brought in a first temporary interim London Strategic Flood Response Plan. This now needs to be updated and needs to take account of surface water flood risk. We need to identify what are the critical assets that lie in the flood zone and where are the vulnerable communities. These need to be figured into the plan so we have a positive action. We need to make sure that we're raising public awareness and importantly their capacity to act. We do not want to be in a situation where we saw in Hull where some poor person is ringing the local authority 15 times to say, where are, the where are the sandbags? We need to enable that person to be able to act independently, and we need to ensure that people know what is it they can do and what can they expect from the, from the state. We need to assist the local authorities in undertaking flood risk assessments, because this is the crucial tool with which we are going to understand and be able to promote more sustainable flood risk management. We need a surface water management plan for London. We need to be able to map that surface water flood risk we need to look at the permeability of the urban realm. We need to make sure we're not constantly relying upon an antiquated drainage network to support this. And this has positives. Designing a sustainable flood risk management program means that we can inject green spaces, street trees, the things that really improve the quality of life that you wouldn't necessarily recognise as a flood defence back into the urban realm. But they're there providing an infrastructural response when we need it. And lastly, we need to make sure that new development is located, constructed, and designed for the climate change you will experience over its design life, not just for the profit of the developers. Thank you.